Howdy, y'all. Surprise, surprise, surprise. It is Chuck Reese of the Bitter Southerner podcast, and we just wrapped up our second season, so you're probably wondering why we're back in your podcast feed. Well, now and then we think it's good to throw off the regular formats and just do something a little bit different. So that is on the menu and pun fully intended there today. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm a huge fan of America's Test Kitchen. I first subscribed to their magazine, Cooks Illustrated, decades ago. And in my house, we're a little bit addicted to their two TV shows on public television, Cook's Country and America's Test Kitchen. Now, ATK also has a podcast called Proof, which will enter its fourth season in April. And in fact, you can hear the first episode of their latest season on April 9th. And Proof goes way beyond recipes and cooking and It digs deep into one particular food every episode. It's history, it's provenance, it's cultural implications, the whole schmear. And that, of course, is exactly the kind of food reporting we love here on the Bitter Southerner podcast. So we're going to share one of Proof's recent episodes from season three. But first, we got to catch up with someone who is always a staple in America's Test Kitchen. Hi. Hi, it's Bridget. Hey, Bridget, it's Chuck. Uh, Mr. Reese, how are you? Madam Lancaster, I am fine. <laughs> I am fine. How are you today? I'm all right. It's, it's a better day now that I can hear your voice. Now, it takes a lot for me to get starstruck, but meeting Bridget did that to me because you got to realize if Bridget Lancaster is on public television, I'm watching every time. Today on Cook's Country, chocolate is on the menu. Bridget and Julia make the ultimate Mississippi mud pie. Adam reviews many food processors, and Bridget and Julia share the secrets to winning whoopie pies. That's all right here on Cook's Country. The Saturday afternoon ritual for me and my wife, Stacy is to sit down and watch Cook's Country or America's Test Kitchen, because we know that whether it's poaching an egg or frosting a cake, you can count on Bridget Lancaster to tell you the no-nonsense way to do it just right. And in her Proof podcast, she goes deeper into the stories of the food we love. Bridget told me how the podcast got started. It all started because during our editorial meetings for magazines and television show, we talk about in America's Test Kitchen, we talk about food all the time, as you can imagine. Um, But we're hyper focused on the recipe, um, the recipe development, the testing, the process. But there's so many things that we have questions about that don't get answered and and things that come up in conversation. I, I was comparing our podcast at one point to the intro of the Seinfeld show, you know, how (laughs) he he gets up on stage and it's this one little thing that really bothers him and he can't let it go and he keeps asking questions about it and then you end up with this hyper-focused episode that's, you know, they said it was the show about nothing, but it really wasn't. It was the show about that one thing. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Whatever that one thing was. Right. Um, And we try to do a little bit of that in proof as well. All right, we're going to be listening to an episode of Bridget Lancaster's Proof Podcast that I have a very special personal connection to, and it's called Come On, (laughs) Y'all. And if you would uh, explain a little bit about what this episode's about, I would love that. I just need you to say Come On, Y'all as my ringtone from now on. I need to record that and uh, just have you say that again. (laughs) again. That sounded so good. (laughs) So this was a story um, that was brought to us by um, a reporter, uh, and she's a friend of ours now um, because she's brought us some amazing stories in the past as well. Uh, Her name's Maya Croth, and she had been living in Spain and really fell in love with ham, the ham over there, uh, especially one particular kind. The I'm not even going to try to say it with an accent, but it's the jamón ibérico de pelota. And it's the really, really expensive ham. That's the way I know it. Uh, yeah. um, uh, the, the, it's, it goes for $100 an ounce. At, yeah, at the, yeah. Or not $100 an ounce, uh, like 25 bucks an ounce the, or something like that. It, 
Yeah, it's it outprices prosciutto, like the really good prosciutto usually. Yeah. And it's a specific type of pig. They're fed a diet that also includes lots of acorns. Um, they're processed, uh, slaughtered a, a specific way. They're aged for up to four years. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of love that goes into these pigs. And there was this family, the Oriole family, uh, a man, Jamie Oriole, and his son. And, and uh, his son is American born, but they're from Spain. And he was wondering what would happen if they took that same process and brought it over to the United States. And they partnered with this this great guy, Will Harris, whom, whom you know. Um, oh, yes. A farmer in Bluffton uh, in Georgia. To take those, you know, as much of the process that they use in uh, making true Iberico ham in Spain and and try to mimic it as much as possible here. But, you know, pecans grow, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. a lot in Georgia, so why not? (laughs) And And they're so tasty. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, why wouldn't you try to feed pecans and and peanuts to to a pig instead of acorns? So it really was about the process of how they did that, how they set it up, um, the challenges um, of, you know, basically you're in ham ground zero, right? Exactly. A lot of producers are, are creating ham down there. I love ham. I could talk about ham for years. Oh, me years. too. My uncle Efford used to cure his own country hams when I was a kid growing up. <sighs> you know, so I grew up eating it. So, so it's a great little episode and... Um, you know, at the end, we got to taste some ham, <laughs> which is always a good thing. You know, I, I just have to tell you that listening to it was such a wonderful experience for me because I wrote a story about Will for the Bitter Southern uh, called The Dirt Underneath. And it kind of remains the thing that I've written that I've, I'm proudest of since we started this thing. And when I was with Will on his farm reporting that story five years ago, he told me that he was beginning to explore working with someone in Spain to get some Iberian pigs. And he drove me out to a section of one of his fields that had uh, a pretty thick stand of pecan trees in it. And he looked at me and he said, have you ever had that Iberian ham? And I said, yes, sir, I have just one time. And he said, can you imagine what that would taste like if they was eating pecans? And I went, oh, my God, that would be wonderful. And he actually had a a herd of goats under that, you know, uh, pinned in in that field and they were like clearing the brush for the piglets to arrive so this episode of your show was like really kind of special to me to listen to y'all did such a great job with it well thank you i I love that you had a completely i mean connected but different perspective of this whole story from the very start because you (laughs) You, well, you knew Will, uh, so he was already in your head and in your heart, it sounds like, too, and the whole experience. And, and to have that question <laughs> asked, can you imagine if, what would they taste like if they were eating pecans? And then, you know, to listen to our story. All right. Let's take a listen to Ham On, y'all. Like any good American cliché, when I moved to Spain for a fellowship in 2012, I fell in love. Not with the man, but with pork. This is our friend, reporter Maya Croth. Specifically, I fell in love with jamón ibérico de bellota, also known as Iberian ham. This is the cured meat of the Iberico pig, thinly sliced from those hoof-on hams that you might have seen hanging from the ceiling at bars all across Spain. 
The meat has this ruby red color, and it's like nothing I'd ever tried before. They slice it so thin that you can see through it. And these pigs, you know, they spend their lives rooting around the pasture lands of southwestern Spain eating acorns. And so when you eat the ham, you can actually taste that nutty flavor. Well, the process and the love actually reminds me a little bit of Italy's prosciutto di Parma. I mean, the expensive stuff, the real good stuff, and it has that protected designation of origin stamped on it. I know that those pigs are fed on a diet that includes the way from the nearby production of making Parmigiano Reggiano. So they must be happy, too. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, jamón ibérico is Spain's answer to prosciutto, but And I'm sure there's going to be people who are going to want to fist fight me about this. But for me, prosciutto doesn't hold a candle to the stuff that I fell in love with in Spain. I mean, the best jamón ibérico de bellota is this very, very specialized product. In its purest form, it comes from only one breed of pig. It has to be 100% Iberico pigs who are free range and have a very specific diet. Those acorns I mentioned a second ago. The pigs are slaughtered at a very specific time of year, between December and March. And they're butchered in a very specific way, and then the meat is cured for a really long time. These hams are salted and naturally air-dried and then moved into temperature-controlled bodegas where they can hang out for up to four years. Compare that to about a year for prosciutto. And often, all of those special qualities are also reflected in the price, which can run into the hundreds or even thousands of dollars per ham. What really makes jamón ibérico de bellota so special is the fat. These Iberian pigs have a unique ability to turn those acorns into muscle tissue that is so marvelously marbled with fat that it almost melts at room temperature. And the best part is that that fat, like the acorns themselves, is rich in oleic acid, which is the same kind of heart-healthy fat found in olive oil. So while living in Spain, I got spoiled because my landlord at the time was this guy named Elias, and he also had a business selling gourmet food products to restaurants all around Barcelona. So Elias would have these parties where he served the best of everything, the finest cavas, the rarest olive oil, caviar, and of course, the best jamón ibérico. So one day after I moved back to the U.S., I'm talking with Elias. I'm telling him how much I miss jamón. It was so difficult to get in the States. You couldn't even find jamón ibérico in the U.S. at all until the USDA approved it for import a little over a decade ago. And even then, only a few specialty shops had it. And the prices were crazy. In my town, there was one Spanish shop that sold jamón ibérico de bellota, and it was about $100 a pound. So I'm wondering, why couldn't someone start making jamón ibérico here in the U.S., right? There's oak trees everywhere, plenty of acorns. But Elias seemed almost offended by this idea. He said, only half-jokingly, it was so American of me to think that you could just co-opt another culture's deeply rooted food tradition and steal away with it across the Atlantic and try to imitate something that the Spanish have been perfecting for literally centuries. And even if someone could figure out how to make jamón ibérico in the U.S., could it ever possibly stack up against the original? But it turns out I wasn't the only one with this idea. My cow herd genetically goes back to the uh, cow herd my great-grandfather brought here in 1866. This is Will Harris, a farmer in South Georgia. He is the fourth-generation owner of White Oak Pastures in the tiny rural town of Bluffton, about 15 miles from the Alabama state line. There are only about 100 residents in Bluffton, and White Oak Pastures employs most of them. The farm has been in Will's family since the Civil War. As he drives me around the farm in his mud-splashed Jeep, I ask him about a rumor I read in a story about him that ran in Eater last year. So is there really a shotgun on the dash? Oh, in the back. Holy (laughs) Not loaded, right? Oh my God, it's loaded. Have you ever had to use it? Okay, man. 
Clearly, I am not from around here. But as much as he tries to play the caricature of the gun-toting southern farmer, Will is actually something of an anomaly. His farm is zero waste, runs partly on solar energy, and has animal welfare certifications for the 10 different breeds of animals they raise on their 3,200 acres. Will calls his style radically traditional because it's a radical departure from the way his dad ran the place and a return to the way his great-grandfather did things. My grandfather would have run this farm in a manner that was very focused on the land, the animals, and community, because that's the way people farmed in the 1800s. <clears throat> My father took over the farm post-World War II, and that was the generation that really made sweeping changes in agriculture, industrialized, commoditized, and centralized. And it was done for noble reasons. You know, Europe was starving post-World War II. It was done to make food cheap and abundant and safe. And it was wildly successful. It made food, I say, obscenely cheap and wastefully abundant and boringly consistent. But it, it had uh, unintended consequences that fell on the backs of the welfare of the animals. I tell people we used to castrate everything born on this farm that wasn't named Harris. So when Will took over, he started to realize that he needed to make some changes. It wasn't so aha uh -huh as a gradual uh, disenchantment, dissatisfaction with the industrial model. The excesses of it were, uh, the unintended consequences <clears throat> were unnoticed consequences. And I started being increasingly aware of them and didn't like it and didn't enjoy it. So I started moving away from it. It was, it was very gradual. Today, Will's farm is the model of something you might see in a Netflix documentary. He drives me past a herd of free-range cows hiding from the scorching September sun in the shade of some trees. And then we visit the laying hens, the geese, and the heritage breed wild turkeys, all pecking freely around the pasture. So those are wild turkeys, heritage breed wild turkeys? Or... Oh, 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 come on, come on, come on, come on, shoot. The turkeys broke down the electric fence. You were almost assaulted by a thousand turkeys. <laughs> the turkeys have escaped. They broke through the electric fence. Finally, we get to what I really came here to see. Iberico pigs. Dozens of them. <laughs> Rooting around in the dirt and wallowing in muddy puddles under the shade of a regal Georgia pecan tree. They're different from the cute pink Wilbur from Charlotte's Web type pigs that I've seen before. These pigs are black and kind of narrow with bristly hair and long pointy snouts. And their legs... Dainty. It's hard to think of a dainty hog, but they're dainty. Their legs are shapely, but they taper down at the ankle in a way that makes me think of can-can dancers. But as I mentioned before, what's really special about these pigs is their fat. Well, they've been called like, walking avocados. The nature of that fat, the, the lipid profile, the fatty acid profile, lends itself to these old world artisan curing methods that we use. The story of how these pigs got here to South Georgia from the grasslands of southwestern Spain begins about five years ago. We were approached by a Spanish family, the Diorio family, and they had secured the permit to export some Iberian pigs from Spain. Before the Orioles and a handful of others got permission to export live pigs around 2014. That hadn't been done since the day of the Conquistadors. Hogs are not native to North America. You know, hogs came from Europe and China. 
hogs have been in this country since the Spanish conquistadors came and brought them as their walking food supply. It's true, there were no pigs in North America until Hernando de Soto brought them over from Spain to what is now the southeastern United States in the 1500s. And now, five centuries later, another Spaniard, well, two actually, wanted to bring over a new wave of immigrants from the old world. Jaime is a, uh, just so European. You know, a lot of, a lot of hugging, very super intelligent guy, very gregarious, very social. Will and Jaime Oriol were an odd pair, but they hit it off. We're very different. You know, I'm an American farmer. He is a Spanish uh, aristocrat, but uh, we, we've become very good friends. Jaime operates an Iberico pig ranch in Spain's Extremadura region. And together with his American-born son, Kurt, was looking for an American partner to raise those pigs here for what they saw as an underserved U.S. market. Here's Kurt. There's a big gap in terms of potential demand because it's not really an existing demand because people just don't know about it. Since 2008, they've been importing Iberico pork in the U.S., but it's not something that's really in the culture as much as, you know, a lot of French-inspired or Italian-inspired foods are. And so, personally, I wanted to pay homage to the traditional heritage of what that food represents in Spain, but also to kind of create, I guess, the American spin or version of it by producing it here locally. So, Will and the Orioles, they're not trying to make it quote-unquote authentic jamón ibérico, right? They're just trying to use the same practices and traditions to create a more American version that's inspired by the Spanish stuff. Right. And in a way, it's a huge experiment. I mean, sure, the pigs are the same. The overall respect for the artisanal way of doing things is the same. But almost everything else would be different in some way from how it's done in Spain, from the more humid climate, which could mean different microbes, to the feed, which we'll get to a little bit later. All of that could impact the final product. So the goal isn't an exact replica, but it's still jamón ibérico. Will felt a kinship with the Orioles' style and their views on animal welfare. Still, it was a big risk. It takes a lot of time and land and resources to make jamón ibérico de bellota. Not to mention red tape. First, the pigs had to be hauled from Spain to Amsterdam, where they hung out in quarantine for a while to ensure they weren't carrying any diseases. Then they were loaded onto an airplane bound for the U.S. Well, they were held in USDA quarantine for about a month. That's about the only way you can make a pig fly. (laughs) Then it took a few months for them to adjust to life in Georgia and start having piglets. And then those piglets spent more than a year rooting around the South Georgia pasture. And then it took another two full years to cure the ham. By the time I visited this past September, it had been five years since Will Harris and the Oriol family formalized their partnership, which they call Iberian Pastures. And the first Iberian Pastures hams were just beginning to come on the market. They are the very definition of a piggy bank. We, we put a lot of money in them in 2014, and we put money in them every single day since 2014. And this is almost the end of 2019 gotten very little back out of them. Well, this seems like a really risky proposition. I mean, what made Will think that it was a good idea? I think Will liked the concept of jamón ibérico, like that it's this very ancestral, close-to-the-earth tradition carried on by generations of family farmers, kind of like what he was trying to do with white oak pastures. Plus, I mean, it doesn't hurt that jamón ibérico de bellota is known for being the most expensive ham on earth. I mean, if they could pull this off, they could sell these hams for up to $1,500 each. We like doing new and exciting things, and it's certainly new and exciting in this country. I've learned a lot by doing it. You know, met some really great people, got some really great partners. You know, like any other business person, we have to make a profit to stay in business, and we hadn't made one yet with, uh, with the Iberian pigs, but we're, we're optimistic. We knew Will knows it's a gamble, not just the Iberico pig project, but his whole radically traditional style of farming. 
trying to bring back this old school, old world artisan model in a country that's been trained to value cost over quality. Americans are addicted to obscenely cheap food. American consumers are so far from that. They're just buying something to eat to satiate hunger and satisfy your mouth is disconnected from how I want animals to be treated and the land to be managed and rural America to flounder or flourish. Well, Maya, I cannot imagine that jamón producers in Spain would be happy with this news at all. I mean, obviously, jamón ibérico, it's not the first specialty product to be produced here in the U.S. Again, going back to prosciutto, they've been producing it in Missouri and other places for years. But I imagine that this particular venture would definitely have some impact on the export market for Spanish producers that are making the traditional stuff. And you would be right about that. I mean, it's not just this particular venture. It's more a fear of what might happen down the line. But At the heart of this issue is whether or not a breed of animal can be given protected designation of origin status. So I talked with David Placer. He's a journalist in Madrid who's been covering the jamón beat since 2018. And I asked him how this news was being welcomed back home. The people who are working in the rise of these pigs are a little bit worried, are a little bit scared about this increasing industry, not only in the U.S., but also in big countries like in China. They think the big industries in the U.S. or in China, they they can do this product more efficiently than they do it in Spain. David says the Spanish government has been reluctant to get involved at all in jamón-related matters, which extend far beyond what Will Harris and the Orioles are trying to do. He explained that when the financial crisis hit Spain in 2008 and 9, the jamón industry was particularly affected. Consumers stopped buying luxury products like expensive ham, and a lot of small independent farms and curing facilities went bust. A nation that has, in the past, run with the bulls and lived to tell another tale, has now been trampled in its path. Nosotros somos el Lehman Brothers de Europa. Spain is the Lehman Brothers of Europe. Prices collapsed, and you started to see more cheap industrial hams on the market, made from pigs that weren't 100% Iberico. There were hams that had not been cured properly, hams that had listeria, often coming out of a long and opaque supply chain that ran not just through Spain, but through countries like Poland and Hungary. This romantic idea of what jamón ibérico should be, this historic breed of pig roaming freely in idyllic pastures, rooting around for acorns, started to get diluted. Maybe it's like the French wine in France or the meat of Kobe in Japan, right? It's one of the most important industries in the country. So here in Spain, the small and the medium producers think that the government and the big industrial companies can do more to protect uh, jamón ibérico as an iconic Spanish product, but they say they didn't do anything for it. The Spanish government finally introduced a four-tiered labeling system to distinguish some of these more industrially produced hams from the authentic jamón ibérico de bellota that's become so famous. In the lower three tiers, the pigs don't have to be fully 100% ibérico breed. They can be crossed with another breed like Duroc, for example. But the strictest classification, the black label, requires the pigs to be free range and 100% ibérico fattened only on acorns. Still, the government didn't go so far as to seek a protected designation of origin for the Iberico breed from the European Union. And that is what has enabled the Orioles, among other entrepreneurs, to export the pigs overseas, to try their hand at making an American version of what some say is the best and most expensive ham on earth. Okay, Maya, I'm hard-pressed to think of a better place in the entire world than Georgia to raise these pigs. Because I know for a fact that the southeastern United States produces some mighty tasty hams. They know pork. 
Yeah, Georgia has a lot going for it, not least the long history of pig husbandry. But we have to remember, this is a breed of pig that has evolved to thrive on the Iberian Peninsula for centuries. Nobody knew what to expect. But Will says not a single one of the 30 original sows and boars has died since coming to America. In fact, they've thrived, having piglets and more piglets, and now the herd numbers around 900 dainty hogs. These little dainty hogs, are they all eating acorns? They're actually not. In Spain, uh, acorns are a important part of the diet for the production system. And we don't have enough of that kind of acorn here. You know, all acorns are not created equal. We uh, are blessed with an abundance of pecans and peanuts. I don't know about you, but I'd rather eat pecans and peanuts than acorns. <clears throat> I can go to Whole Foods and get pecans and peanuts. I don't see many acorns at Whole Foods. Now, that's Will being Will again, but the process of figuring out what to feed these pigs was actually quite deliberate. They worked with a Spanish nutritionist to ensure the feed would produce hams with the same heart-healthy fats that you see in the acorn-fed original, but maybe with a little added Georgia terroir. And Will's staff even went to Spain to see firsthand how the pigs are raised and butchered there, because it's a little different from the way American hogs are typically processed. When Iberian Pastures finally slaughtered its first batch of Iberico pigs in February 2017, they needed to figure out the next step, curing. Curing, in my opinion, is really what makes a ham. Hams are either wet cured or dry cured. And you have these wet cured hams, they're called city hams, that you see wrapped in foil at the supermarket, usually during the holidays. The hams are soaked or cured in a water salt solution. Sometimes sugar is added to the brine. But it's this wet cure that gives that type of meat a somewhat spongy texture. Then you have the U.S.'s version of dry cured hams, and I think they're the closest to prosciutto. They're country hams. These are rubbed with salt, sometimes sugar, sometimes spices, and then they're hung to dry for several months, some even for a little over a year. I know that you can buy them raw or cooked, smoked. But really, it's that dry cure salting process that slowly pulls the moisture out of the meat. And it gives the ham almost a compact texture. Right. And for jamón ibérico, curing is really key. You might even say it's an art. When pork and salt and air come together in the right way for the right amount of time, magic happens. But a lot of things can go wrong in the cure, too. And if Iberian pastures didn't find the right partner... All that time and money the Harrises and the Orioles had invested in this risky venture could be lost. Luckily, they found Herb and Kathy Eckhouse. Herb and Kathy live in Iowa, where they run an artisanal salumi company called La Quercia, whose European-style cured meats are sold in high-end restaurants across the country. And the Eckhouses and the Harrises are simpatico in the sense that they both seem driven to rectify the bad legacy of the American industrial food system by bringing back this sort of artisanal, traditional approach that we associate with the old world. In fact, Kathy Eckhouse says the U.S. is exactly the right place to conduct this kind of experiment. There is a sort of romance and mythology about things that are done in other countries, because when people think about American agriculture, they do think about work on an industrial scale. And I do think there's been a real change. A lot of people, at least, are are really coming to the idea that they want to know the story of their meat. They want to know where their meat comes from. They want to know who prepared it for them. They want to know how the animal lived and how the farmer fared in all that work of getting that meat from the field to their plate. And I think that's a really important element of American agriculture and the American food system going forward. I think people want both tradition and innovation in their food. And I think that's one of the things that American producers can do. For the last two years, Iberian pastures hams have been curing in salt at La Quercia's warehouse outside of Des Moines. I asked Kathy to explain the process. So the basic method is the method that farmers 
have been following around the world for thousands of years. The weather's cold, you slaughter a pig, you eat fresh what you can't preserve, and you preserve with salt various whole muscle pieces of the pig, and we're applying salt and removing water by applying salt. And the salt gets applied very specifically because you want to be sure that you don't end up with a piece of meat that rots because you don't pull out enough moisture, but you don't want to use so much salt that you end up with a salt bomb. La Corte's facility mimics the natural cycle that farmers would have used before refrigeration. The hams start aging on the cold side of the building, which is like winter, and then move to a warmer spring-summer section. And then they would bring it into the warm, and at that point is when you really start to develop flavor and texture. And the flavor and texture is part of the magic of pork, the application of salt and the enzymatic reactions within the meat. It changes the protein structure of the meat, and the meat becomes more silky and the color is fixed, that beautiful rosy color. This year, half a decade after this project began, the first American-made Iberian Pastures hams are slowly being released. Finally, the world will get to see the results of this big experiment in transplanting a centuries-old Spanish tradition into an entirely new context here in the U.S. Will it be as good? Could it even be better? Will, for his part, has all the bravado you'd expect from an American. You know, I'm not sure the product won't be as good. I'm not sure the product might not be better. We'll see. Bold claim. I'm a bold man. Kurt Oriol isn't ready to make those kinds of claims. He just wants to do right by the legacy of this mythical product. And he gets why some people back home might be nervous about what he's doing. It's a very protective thing in Spanish identity. And so when you let your baby fly away, you want to make sure nothing happens to it. If I was from two generations back, I'd be very scared to let some crazy, young, half Spanish, half American kid walk away with our our treasure. Culturally, it's, you know, the most iconic food from Spain. We're not like a large meat processor that's buying animals off the market. We're actually raising them on the ground in a very historic location with a family that's very representative of the American South. And so we're kind of taking the historical and contextual tradition of Spain and inserting it into a cultural equivalent of the historical context of of the Harris family in, in Bluffton. What we're doing is paying homage to the original, you know, mythological being that is the perfect ham, that is cured in the perfect valley, in the perfect natural aired curing chamber. So the gods are still there. We're just uh, bowing to them. (laughs) Okay, Maya, have you had a chance to try this ham yet? How does it stack up? It wasn't easy to chase it down. I mean, this stuff is on back order. There's a months long waiting list, but I did manage to get my hands on just a small sample. And also, I went to that one shop that sells imported Spanish come on, scraped together 25 bucks to buy a quarter pound of it so we could do a side by side taste test. So the other night, I got some friends together at my apartment to try it. I did my best to recreate those great parties that my landlord Elias used to have. So besides the ham, I also bought some nice bread, some Spanish cheese, Spanish wine. I tried to get a bottle of nice Spanish olive oil too, but the shop didn't have any, so I got some Georgia-grown olive oil instead, which seemed fitting. Finally, we got into it. I put out a plate of the jamón from Spain. It was super, super finely sliced, sort of a pink color, and marbled throughout with fat. And then next to it, I put out a plate of the Iberian pastures jamón. It was sliced a little bit thicker, it was kind of a darker red, and it was more streaked with fat than marbled. And some of my friends had never tried any kind of jamón ibérico before. Okay, so let's try the Spanish stuff first so that we know we have a baseline. It's almost like, it's kind of creamy, almost. Like, it's not salty. Mm -hmm. It's buttery. Mm -hmm. Buttery is like a better word. Well, like country ham is much more salty, and it's thicker. This is really buttery. This actually doesn't have much of a taste to me. And that's probably because I am used to Mm. the country ham that's full of salt. 
um, and probably, you know, unnatural flavors. <laughs> but I like this. This is really good because it's like not too heavy. Um, should we try the Georgia stuff? Yeah. I like this better. Do you? It has more flavor to me. Very similar though. Mm, the Spanish was so much smoother and creamier and this is, I'm, I'm having to work on it a little bit. <laughs> the Georgia one. Mm -hmm. See, I feel kind of the opposite. This is saltier too, I think. Yeah, maybe that's, that's why I like, like it. it. It just has more flavor. And it's thicker, it tastes a tad bit gamey, but not in a bad way. And that's not because I'm a southerner. <laughs> Would you kick either one of them out of the bed? <laughs> <laughs> so you like the Georgia. I, I like both. both. You like both? Okay. You're Spain. You're Spain. I'm both, but I do... So, what was your verdict? How does Iberian Pastures compare to the original stuff? You know, it made me reflect on something that's been dogging me the whole time I've been working on this story. I've been so focused on this formula, you know, like, what makes this ham so special? And can you break that down to its component parts and rebuild it someplace else? You know, pigs plus acorns plus salt plus thyme. But I'm realizing that what I was missing and maybe what my friend Elias was so offended by way back when was maybe you can't just reduce something like jamón ibérico to just a formula. I mean, the breed of pig is important. What they eat is important. How they cure it is important. But it's also about the people who make it and the context in which it's enjoyed. My love affair with Jamon can't be separated from those parties with friends in Barcelona and the romance of being in that old city with its old buildings, all those old traditions. And similarly, I think I liked this new American Jamon, which I enjoyed in a new town with new friends, not any more or less than the original, just different. But just because a thing can't be separated from its context, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. And in this case, I'm really grateful that someone is trying. Even though, you know, originally what I wanted was cheaper, more accessible jamón at my fingertips right here in the U.S. And his project really doesn't tick either of those boxes. It's expensive. It's hard to get. But it does tell a story. And maybe that is what we really want from a special food like jamón ibérico. That story from America's Test Kitchen's Proof Podcast was reported by Maya Croft, a producer right here in Atlanta. Special thanks to Bridget Lancaster and all the other good people at America's Test Kitchen we haven't met yet for letting us share their story with all of you today. And you don't want to miss the new season of Proof. It begins April 9th. You can subscribe to the podcast at americastestkitchen.com or anywhere you get podcasts. And that's it for us today. Our producers, Sean Powers and Josephine Bennett, is our editor. Our theme song, Ever South, was written by Patterson Hood and performed by his band, The Drive-By Truckers. And I have to say that I also borrowed from Patterson the line, The Dirt Underneath, for the headline of the story that I wrote about Will Harris five years ago. We've included a link to that story in the show notes for this episode on our website. If you like the Bitter Southerner podcast, please review and rate it on Apple Podcasts. Even if you listen somewhere else, those nice reviews not only make us happy, they help spread the word about what we do. And while you're there, be sure to check out Proof. Subscribe to it, too. I know I have, and I'm catching up as fast as I can. Our show is a co-production of Georgia Public Broadcasting and the Bitter Southerner magazine. You can access more from each episode at gpb.org slash podcast. I'm Chuck Reese, and my three instructions are the same as ever. Hug more necks, abide no hatred, and spend your time doing what you love with who you love. And for right now, make sure you wash your hands a lot. <laughs>